I feel like it's old home week and a couple of people, nothing like coming in and getting hugs and it's safe to do that again for the most part. Welcome to Cincinnati Asian Art Society's February 2023 program and good afternoon. I'm Helen Rinsberg, president of the society. Our speaker today is Dr. Homei Sung, curator of East Asian art at the Cincinnati Art Museum, CAM, since 2002. She is a well-known scholar with over 60 publications in English and Chinese. She has a BA in foreign language and literature and an MA in Chinese history from National Taiwan University. Her PhD is in museum studies from Case Western University. She has organized now 11 exhibits here at CAM, including Decoded Messages, Masterpieces of Japanese Art, Dress to Kill, and recently Galloping Through Dynasties. Now, you will not hear this on her official title on the art museum, but as far as I'm concerned, she deserves a new title, International Art Detective. Her discovery of the magic mirror and the restoration of the Tang Dynasty dancing horse are due to her relentless search for historical accuracy. She has also put us on the map with CNN, B BBC, Smithsonian, and numerous scientific journals in America and Italy who have featured Dr. Sung and her discoveries in their journals. Today, Dr. Sung will talk about the three Korean paintings she acquired for CAM which had no Korean paintings before her arrival. She will introduce how these paintings not only filled a major gap in Camp's collection, but also provided us with the most intriguing examples of how Korean artists transformed the traditional Chinese themes and styles into new expressions in both Korean court paintings and folk art. Let's welcome Dr. Sung. Thank you, Helen, for that introduction. And uh, good afternoon, everyone. Can you get closer to the mic, please? Okay. Is it better? Okay. Well, thank you all for coming on such a beautiful day outside. I, I think uh, I really appreciate that. And um, I, I want to um, talk about the, the, this Korean collection because uh, uh, we seldom have Korean exhibitions or uh, programming or, you know, uh, on Korea because um, people, when people ask me, actually, I tell them that one of the reasons is we don't have a strong, large collection of Korean art, but that is changing. So today I'm going to talk about three Korean paintings like Helen mentioned um, that I purchased or uh, identified. Um, the Cincinnati Art Museum collection is actually scattered in three different departments. Um, actually, in my department, the East Asian department, we have the smallest Korean collection. Most of them are in textile department, textile and fashion, or print department. We have um, but the prints department, most of them, mm, 20th century, most of them. And then um, fashion and textile, we have a, quite a few good Korean costume, textile, shoes, hats, that kind of thing. So I'm going to um, show you the first slide, which shows you the three collections, these are all in textile, and these are in prints department, and these are in my department. So just a few samples, I cannot, uh, this, this whole talk is not about the whole Korean collection, but um, we do have about a hundred some, um, if we count all the small uh, things. So um, when I arrived in Cincinnati, in 2002, uh, I found only one painting attributed to Korea. But after I researched on this painting, uh, which is a tiger painting, but uh, uh, not the one I was, well, anyway, I will 
introduce this later. After I, I did the research, uh, because I, my really highly specialized research is in the Chinese painting of the Ming Dynasty. And um, there are many Ming Dynasty court painters not been recorded uh, or not at least not been recorded in the current dictionary. So when I was doing my research, I recorded some this unknown main court painters. And this, it turned out this Cincinnati so-called Korean painting is a main unrecorded painting. So it was so exciting. Actually, I, I took it as an auspicious sign for me to stay here. But uh, anyway. I will show you that painting later too to compare with the, the, uh, the, the painting I purchased. And um, so um, I have. Yeah, these are the three paintings I'm going to talk about, uh, focus on. Um, the first one is a Korean tiger painting, real Korean tiger painting, <laughs> I purchased in 2019. And um, it's ti depicting tiger and cubs. Uh, I will talk about these three one by one later in detail. So the second, second and third are both Buddhist paintings. And uh, the second painting was in the museum. This is so interesting. Uh, I, I need to explain why there's so much confusion of Chinese Korean paintings because you know, in the, in the old time when art history, East Asian art history first started, people always have problem with the Korean artworks. If they cannot identify, they think it must be Korean. So that's, that's how it was. And then this painting was, uh, when I arrived in 2002, was put, labeled as Chinese Buddhist painting of the Ming Dynasty. <laughs> so this one, I just, changed the, the um, attribution from Chinese to Japanese. And I'll talk about that later. And then this painting, the third one, is a new gift from Bukan Kim. Many of you probably know her. And she found in her storage a large temple painting. It's in, as you can see, in very poor condition. So um, this is totally uh, you are the first to see it, uh, I mean, this image, because we cannot even, I know Cecile is here, our paper conservator is here. We, tr we are now trying to apply a grant to restore it, because um, as I will explain later, this is a very interesting um, sort of folk Buddhist art. Okay, let's start with the, the first one. Okay, this painting, the first tiger painting. Um, this painting, um, because in this museum, we really don't have a designated funds to buy Asian art, East Asian artworks, not like American or European, they have plenty of funds to use. So I typically rely on gifts to, for my acquisition. Um, but th this painting is very lucky because somebody alerted me and everything but the house, there is a Korean painting. <laughs> so I, I got it and I went to take a, uh, take a look and then I, I realized how nice it is and uh, I purchased with a minimal money. So I just want to let you know, this is a um, purchase in 2019 and it's called a Tiger and Cubs. And um, um, you can see there is an inscription here. And uh, I read it and I translate it here. Uh, unfortunately, we cannot find this artist any, in any records. And the, the name uh, Han, if I read it in Chinese, it's Han Zhou. I don't know how to read it in Korean. But um, I consulted a few Korean friends and the people seems not, not, they, they think this name is a little strange. They think it's Chinese, so anyway. So, and uh, even the dates, 
see that the first two character is the dates, but it's a cyclical Chinese date that comes every 60 years, they repeat. So unless you have a time frame, you just can't pin it down. But uh, judging from the style, I think this uh, clearly is a uh, late 18 or uh, the late 19th, um, um, I, I still not sure, so I didn't put it there. But I think it's um, at the earliest, it's the late 19th, uh, no, uh, yeah, late 19th century. Um, but anyway, um, I want to give you a little bit of background about this painting. Um, the theme of tiger and cubs is the it's really the probably the most popular theme in Korean uh, painting, and Korean used uh, you know Korean think tiger. It, they use tiger as their national identity, like a like a logo sometimes. So um, tiger is very popular in Japan. Um, I mean in Korea. Of course, it's popular in China and Japan. And uh, but the original design of tiger and cubs started in China. And the earliest uh, um, record of the tiger and cub theme can be traced to the, as early as the Song Dynasty. And um, the, probably around the 10th century. And uh, of course, we have very, very few Song Dynasty paintings surviving. So, um, but the, even in the Song Dynasty, um, to paint the, for the, an artist to paint this scene is considered very dangerous. So, um, because um, the tigers, the, the tigers uh, is very protective of their young. So, if you, uh, if you, a uh, hunter or a painter wants to paint this, they intrude upon this scene, they almost certainly will be dead. So it's, um, uh, even the male tiger is not approaching uh, when the uh, tigress is nursing the young. So um, the, so the earliest example we have is probably the Ming Dynasty examples. Of course, there are some uh, very interesting copies made after the Song Dynasty uh, a Zen painter called Mu Qi, he painted dragon and tiger as pairs, but not tiger with cubs. But uh, that's the earliest uh, tiger depiction uh, you can see today. And um, also, as for the symbolic meaning associated with uh, the tiger and cubs, uh, as early as the 11th century, the tiger and cubs, uh, based on records, they already developed a political uh, symbolic associations. Um, typically, at, in the Song Dynasty, if you see uh, the, this theme, uh, tiger and cubs, is typically uh, referring to corruption in the government. It, this is based on, on uh, um, ancient Han Dynasty uh, story of um, a Han official called uh, Ning Cheng uh, of the second century BC. And he was known for his abuse of power and uh, cruelty. And those who served under him uh, were described, uh, uh, described him as sheep, uh, a sheep tended by a wolf. After being advised, um, the, after other people advised the emperor to keep Ning Cheng far from the capital. The emperor sent him to serve as a commander of the front frontier pass uh, in Guangdong province. And soon after he, his arrival, there is a popular saying uh, that among, emerged among people who traveled in and out of the pass, and they would say, one would rather face the danger of confronting the scene of a mother nursing, mother tiger nursing the young, than witness the rage of Ning, the official Ning. So since then, people 
give this uh, official uh, name, oh, nickname of Tiger with Cubs. So this reference come, can be traced to this, uh, this story. And now I want to show you a comparison of the Chinese and the Korean um, tiger painting. Here we have, um, this is the one I purchased 2019. This is a painting in Japan depicting the same theme. And this is, oh, this is the painting I, when I first arrived, this is the Korean painting. But now, because I, I know you cannot see, there is an inscription and clearly indicated the artist's name is Xu Gui, and Xu Gui is the unrecorded Ming court painter. So after I proved that, and not only he, he was in the court, he was one of the um, uh, high, uh, get a high official uh, rank. So now what I want to call your attention to is to see, compare, the tiger's pose, this, this tiger's uh, pose, particularly this one, especially close, that's called, a, um, uh, this is one of the three classical Chinese tiger so-called attitudes in the song. And uh, it's watching, the tiger is the king of beasts in China. So they are watching from the height without, the, the three classical Chinese tiger attitudes in the Song Dynasty uh, without the cubs is um, um, first uh, roaring with, with the wind and then watching from the height and then, the, um, and then what's the third one? Um, but what I want to point out is you can see clearly this is the same pose, and this pose can be traced to the Song Dynasty. So the Chinese started to paint this design. This design was preserved in many later copies. And you can see this Korean paint, painting basically is still the same design. The reason I know this design is Song Dynasty design is based on written records describing the Song painting. And uh, you can see, uh, supposedly, the original Song painting we can no longer see has um, the tigress low, lowering her body to meet. There is a supposedly a little tiger trying to reach the mother for for the uh, mother's breast for nursing, and this one, and trying to find the mother's breast. And then this one, one according to the record, one is climbing on the mother's uh, back, and one is rolling on the ground trying to nurse, and the other one is standing right next to the mother's leg. So this is a detailed, de very detailed um, description uh, in records. So you can see this Korean painting is basically still trying to follow this uh, design, uh, except maybe after so many years, so many hundreds of years, maybe he, he couldn't fully understand the meaning. So the nursing tiger moved some, somewhat away. And then, but uh, still one is next to the mother's leg. And uh, this one is, yeah, this is the nursing tiger, but he's supposedly rolling on the ground. But anyway, <laughs> so this adjustment, you can see, um, this Korean painting is still based on the traditional Chinese classical uh, model of this design of so-called nurse uh, hmm? tigers nursing the young. Um, also, I want to point out that you can see this painting suffered a lot of trimming. Uh, clearly, this, this inscription should have more space, and not only here, but on the top. Typically, there is magpies on the chirping because that's a natural, uh, actually, it's a natural phenomenon. When the tiger was uh, under the tree, the birds start to make noises. And, uh, but anyway, um, so this very likely originally still have the magpie. I, I wrote uh, another paper on this. Um, 
the mag tiger and the magpie. Um, but I don't want to, to go uh, too far from our topic. And uh, next, I want to show you. Okay, next I want to show you the Korean folk art. See, this is this is our painting, and these two folk art still kept this design: tiger and nursing the young, and the, the, with the magpie. So this shows you how the influence of the uh, the, the original classical Chinese design spread to uh, even. Korean folk art. Okay, let's move to the next. Okay, this is the, the second painting. Um, this is a Buddhist painting, Buddha with the pupils. And um, this painting came to the museum in 1957. That early, but it was listed as a Chinese Buddhist painting. So after I spent some time to research, and I, I really am confident it's a Korean painting. And uh, not only that, I also consulted some Korean Buddhist uh, specialists, and they agree with me, it's definitely a Korean work. And this painting depicts um, a central deity here with a jeweled crown in the, in the middle in the center and uh, seated on a throne and with an elaborate, beautiful uh, robe. And, um, and uh, the beautiful clouds and uh, his attendants all indicate uh, the celestial uh, status of this deity. And uh, flanking him are three pairs of um, attendants. You can see the attendants are depicted as much smaller. That's the typical way to show the hierarchy of the, the different um, deities. And that we, you see the two, in the front are two male attendants um, judging from their hats and uh, also their robes their, and also the official tablets they are ho holding one red, one white. Um, judging from all these, we can um, we can tell that uh, uh, they are officials. They are um, typical. They 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 are court officials. And uh, behind them, you see two female attendants. And then uh, they are they are holding a uh, sort of a royal umbrella. That's the typical uh, uh, setting. And then at the very back, there's a, a boy and a girl, these two. And that's, in, that's again, can be traced uh, to very old, um, well, I should have mentioned it later. Uh, it's the Jin Tong, the golden boy and the jade lady, that uh, in Chinese tradition. Uh, but anyway, uh, so this is the basic description of the painting. And the, now I want to point out that the principal deity uh, featured here can be identified as, well, I, after research, I identified this as the Hindu god Indra. And this deity became highly popular in Korea, especially in the temple paintings in the 18th century. And the emergence of this deity, uh, this one, and um, of course, uh, I will talk about uh, the change of the deity from Hindu into a more uh, Chinese styled, uh, depiction. Um, but uh, first of all, I want to point out that th this deity is very popular, um, not only very popular, it is signaled a major change in Korean, uh, in Korean uh, Buddhist uh, painting. Because during the Joseon period, um, the ruler 
uh, the Korean ruler adopted Confucianism. Uh, before that, the court always patronized Buddhism as the national philosophy religion. But uh, during the Joseon period, um, just uh, around the 17th, 18th century, the court uh, started to adopt the embraced uh, Confucianism as the national philosophy and uh, turned against Buddhism and e occasionally even persecuted Buddhist uh, Buddhism. So as a result, many Buddhist temples moved to rural areas. And this change of patronage also led to the emergence of new type of Buddhist paintings. Um, typically, the, they started to show a type of painting uh, of a main deity surrounded by many minor deities and guardian figures. And uh, also, very often, they start to have mixed religions, including Hindu, Chinese Buddhism, Taoism, and folk traditions, mixed kind of uh, uh, deities here. That's why I was trying to point out these two, uh, these two young maiden and a boy is the, actually has the Taoist origin called the Jin Tong and Yu Nu. That means golden boy and the jade uh, girl, something like that. But anyway, that's um, and also this Indra. This is the most interesting one. Indra originally originated in India as a Hindu god. But after it was introduced to China, under it changed its name. It's called Di uh, Shi uh, Tian, or in Japanese, Chi Sha Ten. And uh, the identity of Indra became, during this time, after they were introduced to China, they became in be confused with the Chinese Taoist deities, particularly one deity called the, the, um, the Jade Emperor, or Yu Huang Da Di. That's the, um, the sort of a, the uh, supreme deity of the universe in China, in, according to Taoism. And uh, since uh, Indra in India was the supreme god, the highest uh, uh, sovereign uh, of the universe. So, and in China, it's the Jade Emperor. So they, these two start to start to um, get mixed together, and uh, the transformation um, actually occurred during the Song Dynasty, which is about 10th century to uh, 12th century. And, but it is clearly reflected here, as you can see. Hindu Indra image, which is very masculine and a very, uh, looks very fierce and scary kind of uh, image, and uh, always holding the, the vira, the, 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 uh, in multiple hands, and uh, this Indra is sort of a more effeminate royal figure, just like the Tao, Taoist uh, Jade Emperor. And he was accompanied also by his, the Taoist uh, Jade Emperor has two favorite attendants, the, the golden boy and the, and the Jade girl. So these are all come from the uh, Chinese uh, Taoist uh, influence. Um, so that's why I, I believe this, this image of Indra is clearly modified after the Chinese version of the Jade Emperor. And the heavily jeweled crown and the robe and the hand gesture um, and the fabrics covering the throne and and also the royal accoutrements and the attending officials, particularly the jade girl and the golden boy, they are all consistent with the iconography of the jade emperor. And uh, 
also barely recognizable as the Hindu uh, image of Indra. And, uh, but overall, this painting, you can see, it's a very fine, elegant style. Um, so this painting clearly comes from the court. The Korean uh, is a, a fine masterpiece of the uh, court Buddhist art. Okay, now let's move to the to this painting. Um, this is a Korean temple painting. They dated probably early 19th century. And uh, it's painted on hemp fiber. Again, it's a folk painting. Uh, normally it's on silk, but uh, this is on hemp fiber. And this is the painting donated by Bu Kang Kim in 2021. And it's quite large. You can see the measurements. Uh, oh, the measurements, I didn't list it, but it's about uh, 55, almost 56 inches by 48 inches. So it's quite large. And uh, it depicts multiple deities and the guardians. Um, um, this, this type of painting, uh, as I mentioned earlier, in the 18th century, there's a change of uh, patronage in the court. So there's a trend to depict um, uh, a type of temple painting that uh, shows many uh, guardians, figures, or uh, minor attendants that come from um, other mixed religions. And uh, I, I did point out that uh, this is because the court patronage changed from, Confucian, from Buddhism to Confucianism, and they turned against Buddhism. And uh, the Buddhist uh, followers losing patronage from the court and the royal uh, families, they typically um, uh, sometimes they faced a persecution. So many, um, many temples, Buddhist temples, moved to the rural areas, and uh, typically in the mountains. And this made Buddhism more accessible to actually to commoners instead of the court and the aristocrats. And then they became um, um, uh, like a people's, uh, tend to reflect the people's uh, faith and taste. Um, the most interesting part is probably um, this, um, this type of more folks, folk uh, related uh, depiction featuring uh, protective deities or guardians from not only other religion, but also uh, folk beliefs. You can see this is clearly not compared with the court, earlier court Buddhist painting. This painting is much uh, less elegant, it's more like a crude, and uh, it's a, a very interesting though. Uh, here, the main deity is still Indra, because Indra is very popular during this uh, time in the temple. There are a total of 24 figures arranged in four rows here. All the deities are surrounded by pink clouds. I don't know if you can see. Yeah, indicating their, uh, their, their celestial status. And uh, on the very top, the two main deities are these two featured, um, prominently featured, and they are both larger in size, and uh, they both have halos, and uh, they have, um, the, one, um, the one on the right, this one, um, can be identified as Brahma. Again, it's a Hindu origin god. Uh, God of creation, and he holds a big lotus 
I don't know if you can see the detail, but uh, he holds a big uh, lotus stem. What I really wanted to um, to point out that is that uh, there are lots of you. You see the increase of the guardian figures of very. This is actually the guardian figures are far more colorful and more interesting, and um, I think uh, the. They are these kind of. They added a lot of uh, um, this kind of uh, protective guard, guards or guardians because they appeal to the common people as a means of uh, rallying as men as much spiritual protection as possible to preserve not only themselves but also their faith. So this colorful depiction um, shows the really changed, developed during this time uh, in uh, Korean Buddhist painting. The, one of the interesting, I, I'm not going to identify all the, the deities, but if you notice, uh, there is um, on the, in the middle of the third row, this uh, figure here, here, with a multiple, he has multiple eyes, and that's the Vairag Yaksha. It's one of the five guardian kings who protect Buddha's laws. And the Vairag Yaksha typically has uh, multiple arms and eyes and a head. It's really hard. It's the frontal face and the two side face. So he has three heads and six arms. That's, that's easy. That comes inherited from the Hindu god. And then uh, further down at the bottom, you can see a, a very interesting figure here. This, again, it comes from a folk religion. This is the dragon king. And the reason I want to point out this one is this deity was typically in China, is typically portrayed as a white-haired old man with bulging eyes and holding uh, a, a jewel. He, he is holding, the dragon king uh, is holding a wish-granting jewel created from Buddha's relics. So that's his... Um, iconography. But Dragon King was widely worshipped in Asia as a god with divine powers to control rainfalls, rivers, and seas. And therefore, they were, uh, this god is also uh, overseeing harvest and a safe sailing. Um, but it is seldom depicted as a main deity in Buddhist temple painting, almost n not seen in, in China and, um, or Japan. And so the great emphasis of Dragon King here suggests that this painting was very likely made for a temple near the sea and where fishermen frequently visit and prayed for their safety journey in the rough sea. So this is the unique feature of this uh, uh, type of folk uh, Buddhist painting. Another unique feature of this painting is the appearance of this deity. I don't know if you can see, it looks like a monkey. And this is the, the Monkey King, also originated in Chinese folklore. And the uh, Monkey King, um, who, in, according to the Chinese folklore, he accompanied the Tang Dynasty monk, Xuanzhuang, to India to retrieve Buddhi uh, Buddhist uh, sutras. And this is a uh, uh, related in a Chinese classical novel called uh, Xi Yu Ji or Journey to the West. Some of you may have seen movies or, or uh, cartoons depicting that. 
And uh, so this monkey is an immortal, sort of an immortal monkey, dressed in full armor. I don't know if you can see that, hold, holding a pole arm here. And uh, standing right next to the Dragon King. And uh, he appears to be in conversation with the Dragon King. The inclusion of this deity from folk tales and beliefs it demonstrate the greater freedom gained by the rural temple painters to embrace the popular culture during this time. So interestingly, these two paintings um, both depict the main deity of Indra here and here. And then uh, they are all original, the original deities of in India. And then, but uh, if you view, if you see these two paintings together, and uh, that's what made me feel very excited because the, if you look at them together, they allow us to see not only the different styles, one in the, developed in the court, one in the countryside as a folk painting, but also that they, are, they also reflect the major shift in Buddhist um, patronage in court, the court patronage shift from Buddhism to Confucianism and uh, how the religion developed uh, uh, changes uh, because Buddhism start from the main patronized uh, uh, official religion to the countryside as a folk uh, Buddhist art. And uh, this change of practice is very interestingly reflected here in these two paintings we happen to have. So I was thinking uh, in the future if um, we can find space and we can uh, resolve the lighting issue in our Buddhist gallery because we have sunlight coming in, in the gallery. I would like to display these two works together to help people understand the change. And then um, these are the three paintings uh, newly uh, added to our Korean painting collection. But as I was preparing for this lecture, just in the last month, somebody gave me a Korean fan. So I thought I'd just mention it. They become the fourth Korean painting. <laughs> so you can see this is a sort of scholar, scholar, we call scholar painting or literati painting. And with the poems, this is by Kang Se Wong. And uh, he's a very well-known scholar official in Korea. And uh, he also, uh, particularly, he he developed a painting um, called uh, uh, in Korea called the True View. Basically, uh, the artist travel to the site and then depict realistically what they see. And also, they are sometimes influenced by the Western painting perspectives. And uh, so, this painting is a very good addition. And I am still researching on this painting, very likely painted in his late years. He, he is a, a very admired uh, artist. And uh, I, I really hope our Korean uh, art will grow. Um, the more works we have, the more we can justify create a Korean area or Korean gallery. And that's my wish. Uh, whether through gifts or acquisition. So um, hopefully that will happen. That's it. Do you have any questions? I'm sorry, I, I was a little worried because you really couldn't see the Buddhist, uh, uh, that, uh, that Bukang's uh, painting very well. But uh, uh, sorry, I don't have the details. Uh, because it's a bad condition, we, we don't want to handle it. We don't want to unroll it, so we didn't take any detailed pictures. Okay. Okay. Question and answer time then. All right. Mickey. So, Mickey, your question was that the two figures in the back were identified as Taoist children, but could she say more about the two figures in the front? 
Well, take, the take the first one, okay. Well, the two officials, I did go through, you know, I really wish I could go to Korea to study, but uh, yeah, but uh, we don't have the budget for that. And uh, I don't even, we, our library doesn't even have Korean language books, unfortunately. So I did go through a lot of uh, similar paintings depicting uh, Indra and uh, in the Chinese version of the uh, Jade Emperor. And uh, they typically have these two officials. But I did notice that, you notice that one is holding a white colored one, one is holding a red one or a blue one. I don't, one side is blue, I think. Mm -hmm. So I do think this also, this is my preliminary, oh, I like speculation. Just, just because I think there's the yin yang concept here in the Chinese cosmos. The, the, the supreme god of the universe is the Jade Emperor or the Indra. But the, there are yin yang, the Taoist aspects are all reflected here. And that's why I found it so interesting. But uh, you know, um, Buddhism started in India, went to China, and then eventually, very often the Chinese influenced the Korean Buddhist art and the Japanese. So the early Chinese adoption of the Taoist concept into the transformation from Indra to the Jade Emperor included some of the other Taoist attendants, minor deities, and concepts. So need a lot more research, but I do believe there is the yin and yang aspect. Right, right. Okay, right. so the, the comment was and, uh, even though they're dressed as Confucian officials, they're probably Taoist. No, no? Uh, they still shows the confusion. It's a mix. Yeah. It's not really pure Taoist. Um, Actually, you see the, the, the sun and moon, all that kind of thing there, the red and white dots. I, I, am, I am still researching, but I do think in general, uh, this Chinese, the Indra transformation to the Chinese Jade Emperor happened in the Song Dynasty, very early, like 10th, 12th century. So, by this time, it's, this is a uh, 18th century. So this mix is even more complicated. What's the far background in the top? I think this painting is also trimmed. And also, well, oh. this is a celestial world. So there's a pink clouds on the top. And the, 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 royal, the royal accoutrements of the umbrella, you see the royal umbrella. And uh, I don't know what, there may be buildings, you know, just like a typical Buddhist uh, art showing the palace. Okay, question is, how did you figure out it was actually Korean and not Chinese? Well, by style, basically by style. The first major uh, thing is uh, somehow the Chinese and the Korean artist um, they base the different traditions. They naturally reflect their different characters. Just like when you compare a Japanese painting or Chinese painting and Korean painting. So we are starting to be able to see more examples and to establish their styles more. We can differentiate more. There used to be a lot of confusion between Chinese Korean Buddhist painting, Japanese Buddhist painting. <laughs> Everybody thinks this painting is the best, and it, the Chinese person is Chinese, Japanese person is Japanese. <laughs> but now, there's so much research. Uh, I'm not a specialist, but uh, I, I can differentiate in general. Um, but I, that's why I also consulted uh, another curator, Korean uh, curator, about the identity of this. You, you can actually go back to the um, Asian Art Society webpage when Dr. Peter Dobler did his talk in September on a screen that was went from being Chinese to being Japanese to finally being identified as Korean. 
Um, so it's, it's a tangle. So you want clarification on how different that second row of figures looks from the third row. From the third row. Okay, especially, especially their faces? Especially your faces, okay. Yeah, I think these are exotic. Um, they may copy the from Hindu related uh, figure. Whenever they, the, I hate to say this, the Asian painting, they paint foreigners, they exaggerate the big eyes, the big tall nose, and the, you know, that kind of, I think these are all related to the more esoteric kind of aspects of the, Buddhist uh, art. And these are more Chinese style, the face, the female, like a figure and official. So it's really very well, uh, very mixed. Did I answer your question? And they copy from different models. That's the, that's the thing. And especially when it comes to folk art, people really don't have enough resource to to copy after or model after. And they mixed them, and they just want protection. So as many as possible. <laughs> the and, Dragon King. And, and sometimes they've never seen, I, I know what the Japanese did to, to the Portuguese, which is pretty astonishing. And it's because they didn't see the Portuguese. They just, you know, like the telephone thing, they just get passed on and passed on. And, and yeah, interesting. The question is, about the confusion that some of the Asian countries had about the striping and the spotting on the tigers, that sometimes they thought the young were actually spotted like leopards and the olders were yes. striped like tigers. Like here so. and, and here. Yeah. You know, I, I actually thought, uh, this, I thought about this for, uh, because I noticed uh, in many paintings, and um, I researched on this, and I found in the earliest time uh, records about the paintings as early as 4th century, 6th uh, dynasty in China, they already combined tiger and leopard together as one category. That could cause that confusion sometimes. And uh, when they painted together, this, they consider as one category they may have painted on the same screen together at that early time. And that could be a tradition later artists just keep following. But uh, of course, they, uh, tiger is native in China, but I don't know about leopard. And, uh, but the Chinese have leopards because they have attribute items from everywhere. In mm -hmm. Okay, yes. so the question is, are there good museums in, are, are there museums in America that have good Korean collections so that when we travel, where can we stop? Um, actually, uh, the Brooklyn Museum has a good collection. The Metropolitan has a good collection. Every collection has their own strength and weakness. Like, this one has more Korean painting. That one has more ceramic. and uh, So there, it really depends. The good thing is now everybody's post their collection online. So it's helpful for you when you research, you can find it. And uh, before. One, one of the biggest problems is like our tiger painting was, was up for the year of the tiger. It will now be in storage for five years. There's, there's no chance of it being up again because of the conservation guidelines that we follow to make sure that we are preserving it the best as possible. So as Home said, a lot of times going online to see the collection, um, I really would like to recommend the Metropolitan Museum's Heilburn Timeline of Art History. It is exceptional. The essays are exceptional. The, um, the photographs of the artworks are exceptional. And they have a huge breadth of collection. I'm not as familiar with Brooklyn except for the Japanese collection. Um, but if it's, if they're Korean, it's like they're Japanese, I would definitely jump on Brooklyn and then just wait to see if someone has an exhibit come up. That's the best way of catching um, most of these paintings because they're really protected to preserve them so that our great-great-grandchildren can enjoy them too.
Okay, so the question is about the paint that is being used, the, the inks that are being used. Okay. Well, the ink is more, you know, all made from pine suit and, you know, so, but every country have their own, every period have different inks. Are you talking about the, the paint. yeah, the, you, you mean they use more ink than color? The color, the, the, the Asian painting color, mostly mineral color, not water color, so they last longer. They, co they typically combine ink and color. Uh, for, especially for animal painting, you know, they use the ink for the black stripe or then mix with the color and they do a lot of wash. wash. And then um, this, this slide is not very good, but uh, um, they do use a lot of color. And, uh, but uh, for scholar painting, like the fan I showed you, they scholar typically use more monochrome ink to paint. Oh, a carbon and lacquer, I think is mostly what's in ink. Ink, the ink they use the soot, pine soot. Pine soot, And yeah. they burn it and then create a black color and then create an ink stick and then ink stick ground on the ink stone to make ink. Is that's that? basically black. Color. Black. That's black. It's How about the red one? Oh, that's the cinnabar mineral to create the color, all kinds. Malachite, lapis lazuli, um, those are the ones I know off the top of my head. Okay, yeah. so the question is on the third piece um, of the folk art, are you in the process of doing conservation on that work? Cecile is here. Cecile is our paper conservator. And she and I, we, we are now applying Korea, uh, part of the Korean government grant to have someone come and give us an assessment of the condition and if possible, ship it to Korea to restore. We, we definitely don't have funds in this museum to restore or even remount any of the Asian scroll paintings. So that's why I relied on Helen's Asian Art Society. Sometimes we have donation to help us um, to restore or conserve some of our scroll paintings. Actually, um, sometime in the future, we would like to give a talk on that topic. To, we did one sometime mm. ago, but uh, people sometimes don't know what it takes to restore Asian um, painting. Asian scrolls, average 10 years, you need to pay attention to see the condition, if it need remount or or need some conserv conservation. So we will have Cecile give us expert opinion on those. But we are now in the process of applying this grant. As you can see, we cannot even unroll it easily because we do it once and we, we don't want to touch it. It's mm -hmm. cracking in the middle and uh, on the sides. Mm -hmm. the, the age, just to promote us, the Asian Art Society, we have an endowment fund that generates funds for our annual art lectures. We have, during COVID, established a <laughs> conservation fund, which kind of got held up because curators weren't traveling to do the assessments we need. Our next um, assessment will be of the Damascus Room, which I think Ainsley has scheduled for June, if I'm right, um, and then homemade her funds are going to be going for mounting um, the, the next exhibition. The next exhibition. Paintings. So paintings that of a contempt modern, I guess it's called modern since he died, yeah. um, modern artist to have those properly mounted for that. So yeah, if you want to give money, we'll take it. <laughs> Our treasurer is here. There is a great need, that's true, yeah. because uh, uh, typically Western museums didn't have funds for Asian conservation. They do have funds for oil painting, et cetera, but not, not let, let me just painting. put that in context, too. When Homei discovered the uh, presentation of a prince Japanese screen and how important it was to the um, can canon of Genji paintings, um, the government of Japan, through their national, I'll never get the title right, research institute, um, we sent it to them. 
It took $25,000 to send it over to Japan and back because of the insurance and Homei had to go with it. I must say that there are some generous people in the audience right now who helped to fund that and send it over. Yeah. And then it's my estimate, considering how many months they had it, that they probably spent about $100,000 to it was, it was do that was It was the, they, they, they restore for us for free, free. because it's a very important like national treasure. But just to ship it there before it arrived, we still have to pay. And we don't even have that much money. That's why we need a fundraising from Asian Arts Society. <laughs> so anyway. So maybe we can start a fund for the Korean painting. When, <laughs> we can. Yes. So. This has been a terrific question and answer series. I, I mean, I must congratulate you all for some great questions. And um, so thank you so much for coming and making this a terrific presentation today. Thank you, Homet. Thank you.